IB Bio, Genetic Modification and Biotechnology Part 3 covers three topics, the last two of which are specific to the IB syllabus. The first looks at how genes of interest are isolated. This is not in the IB syllabus, but it's important in terms of the storyline through the biotechnology unit. The second topic looks at gene amplification, and the third topic looks at DNA analysis. The essential idea is biologists have developed techniques for artificial manipulation of DNA, cells, and organisms. You can see here the topics covered in each of the three movies within the biotechnology unit. Use this outline to focus your study. This movie is focused here. In this image, you can see the use of a probe, sometimes called a primer. Scientists often know something about the gene that interests them. They know short base sequences, and they use this knowledge to construct the radioactively labeled probe. And again, in certain circumstances, the probes are known as primers. Keep this in mind. The probes are then mixed with the entire genome that's been cut into fragments, and the radioactive fragment seen here is the gene of interest, and this can be isolated. In this image, we can see the DNA from the organism of interest cut into fragments with a restriction enzyme. And then the fragments are separated on a gel in a process known as gel electrophoresis. I will speak more about this technique later in the movie. The gel is then washed with a radioactive probe, primer, and the DNA fragment with the gene of interest can be isolated. Another mechanism, similar in effect to using a gel, is to use a microarray, some, some call it a DNA chip, and to each spot on the array is a short known base sequence, a probe, sometimes called a primer. Each probe would represent a short section of a gene, a different gene on each spot. The genome DNA from the organism with the gene of interest is cut the fragments are radioactively labeled, and then the chip is washed with the fragments, and the radioactively labeled spots would have the gene of interest hybridized to the probe. Here's an image of the microarray with 6,400 spots. The actual size is about 2 centimeters by 2 centimeters. One last technique to isolate the genes of interest uses the mRNA available in metabolically active cells to build the genes, the DNA, using an enzyme found in RNA viruses called reverse transcriptase. Hopefully you remember this image showing replication, transcription, translation. We looked at this image when we studied transcription translation earlier in this course. As well, in this image, we can see the RNA-directed DNA synthesis by the enzyme reverse transcriptase. The beauty of using mature mRNA molecules to build the DNA gene is that the introns have been removed so that the DNA sequence that's built represents the pure gene. In this diagram, the process of building DNA using reverse transcriptase is shown. The original gene is here, introns and all. The raw mRNA transcript is here, including the introns, but soon enough, the introns have been removed. The mature mRNA is isolated from cells, and its very presence indicates an active gene. The mRNA is then mixed with reverse transcriptase and deoxyribonucleotides to build the DNA base sequence representing the gene of interest. Using this technique not only isolates genes of interest, but also examines gene expression because the mRNA molecules represents the genes that are being expressed. Here's the process in full. We have a tissue sample with active cells. We isolate the mRNA from those cells. The mRNA molecules are then used to copy DNA with reverse transcriptase. And labeled nucleotides give the fragments, the DNA fragments, they're single-stranded fragments, uh, some fluorescence. Now, we hybridize the copied DNA to a DNA microarray, uh, the probes uh, on the microarray. We rinse off the excess DNA. We scan for fluorescence, and each fluorescent spot 
represents a gene expressed in the original tissue. One more time, we isolate the mRNA from active cells. We copy DNA from the mRNA using reverse transcriptase, and we have labeled nucleotides. We apply the DNA to a probe microarray, and each fluorescent spot represents a gene expressed in the tissue. Here is the first relevant IB syllabus statement for this movie. State that in gel electrophoresis. Proteins or fragments of DNA move in an electric field and are separated according to their size. Gel electrophoresis is an important technique in biotechnology. DNA, cut with a restriction enzyme, creates fragments, and the fragments are placed into the wells of a gel. The gel is composed of agarose or a polyacrylamide, depending on whether we're working with DNA or proteins, respectively. The fragments of DNA move in an electric field toward the positive electrode. The DNA fragments separate according to their size. Small fragments move the furthest in the gel. After gel electrophoresis is over, the gel can be analyzed. Stay tuned for more on this. Here is another image of gel electrophoresis. The DNA fragments are placed into the wells of a gel, and the fragments are subjected to an electric field. DNA has an overall negative charge, so the fragments migrate toward the positive electrode. The movement of the large fragments is restricted by the gel, so at the end of a certain period of time, the end of a run, large fragments would be found here, and small fragments would be found here. Over the next four slides, let me show you a technique using gel electrophoresis to determine the evolutionary relatedness of three species, B, C, and D. The technique has the DNA of each species cut into fragments using the exact same restriction enzyme, and the technique will use a probe or a primer. In this image, the DNA of species B, C, and D has been cut using a single restriction enzyme, and if you're wondering about species A, be patient. The fragments of each species, B, C, and D, are run in separate lanes on a gel using gel electrophoresis. And the banding pattern seen here is the result. The gel is then blotted with a paper, known as nitrocellulose paper, so that the DNA molecules in the gel and the DNA molecules of each fragment in each of the three lanes stick to the blot paper. I've used dotted lines on the nitrocellulose paper to represent every fragment in the original gel. And the last step involves rinsing the blot paper with a radioactive probe primer from species A. And the radioactivity appears most with species C. So species A and C are the most closely related. Repeating this process could elucidate the relationships among all four species. Here is one last image that describes what's called the southern blot technique. Three sets of DNA fragments are separated using gel electrophoresis. The gel is then put into contact with nitrocellulose paper that picks up the molecules from each fragment in the gel. The blot paper is removed and washed with a radioactive probe to produce bands that correlate with the probe. Remember that probes are short known sequences of bases. Here's the next IB syllabus statement for this movie. Outline the use of PCR, polymerase chain reaction, to copy and amplify minute quantities of DNA. Once we have a small piece of DNA, one must amplify the quantity for further analysis, and this is done using PCR polymerase chain reaction. It amplifies minute quantities of DNA of interest using primers as the probes to select the gene of interest. Now, DNA can be extracted from bands in a gel directly, but there's another approach to amplifying the DNA of interest. We cut the whole genome into fragments, use the primers, the short known sequences of, of bases, to select the sections of DNA that will be copied 
only the sections to which the primer binds gets copied. In this way, many copies are made of small sections of the DNA of interest. Let's take our first look at the process. We have a test tube with the DNA, and we heat the test tube to separate the two strands. Now we add to the test tube nucleotides, primers, which are known sequences of DNA or RNA, genes of interest, and TAC polymerase, which is an enzyme that functions at higher temperatures. TAC polymerase is derived from a bacterium that thrives in hot springs. Now you can imagine the process. The primer will only bind to the gene of interest. The enzyme polymerizes the DNA using the nucleotides. Round one, the gene of interest is doubled. But we want to amplify the quantity of DNA more than once, so the process runs in cycles, one, two, three, Let's take a look. We heat the DNA to separate the DNA. We cool it so that the primers can bond to the DNA of interest. DNA polymerase, TAC polymerase, synthesizes the DNA end of round one, and then we run the cycle again and again, and the gene of interest is amplified exponentially. Once again, the PCR process with source DNA DNA polymerase, TAC polymerase, nucleotides, and primers, and the primers are built to target the gene of interest. First, we heat the DNA to separate the DNA, denatures the DNA. We let it cool so that the primers can bind to the DNA, and then TAC polymerase synthesizes, polymerizes DNA using the nucleotides. The synthesis starts from the primer, thus we amplify only the DNA of interest. Cycle one is complete, Repeat, repeat. So PCR provides enough DNA for DNA analysis. And DNA analysis is used in DNA fingerprinting, in forensics cases, paternity cases, immigration cases, or genetic diseases. As well, DNA analysis is used to determine evolutionary relationships. We can sequence DNA and mapping chromosomes, in other words, locating genes on chromosomes in the genome. Now, we will come back to analyze DNA profiles, but at this point, I want to digress with a short section on Fred Sanger's method of sequencing DNA. Fred Sanger's di-deoxynucleotide technique for sequencing DNA fits here because it uses gel electrophoresis, and it would be used to sequence pieces of DNA following amplification of DNA using PCR. I could have chosen to introduce Fred Sanger's di-deoxyribonucleotide technique when we studied replication or in part one of biotechnology when we looked at the Human Genome Project. In any case, the IB syllabus statement for HL students only is describe the use of di-deoxyribonucleotides to stop DNA replication in preparation of samples for base sequencing. Let me introduce you to a di-deoxyribonucleotide, and I'm going to start on the left. In this slide, we have a ribonucleoside here. It's a nucleoside, not a nucleotide, because of the three phosphates, like ATP. This molecule would be incorporated into a growing RNA polymer with the cleaving off of two phosphates to become a nucleotide. This should be review, and if it's not, then you might want to go back and review the movies that cover replication. In the middle, we have a deoxyribonucleoside. Notice the lack of the oxygen atom attached to the number two carbon of the ribose sugar. This molecule would be incorporated into a growing DNA polymer with the cleaving off of two phosphates. Now on the right, we have a di deoxyribonucleoside. Both the number two and number three carbons of the ribose do not have an oxygen atom attached. Once this molecule is incorporated into the polymer, the missing oxygen atom here prevents another nucleotide from being added. This results in termination of DNA synthesis. Sanger used the chain termination of di-deoxynucleotides as a tool to sequence the DNA. Stay tuned.
So to sequence DNA, Sanger's technique used DNA replication with the dideoxynucleotides, and then he ran the fragments that formed because the dideoxynucleotide was a chain termination step. He ran those fragments on, on a gel. Now what he did is he set up four test tubes, each with the following, DNA to be sequenced, primers, DNA polymerase, and nucleotides, and then here's the creative part. He added dideoxynucleotides, one of each of the four base types, into the four separate tubes. So he set up four test tubes, all with the DNA to be sequenced, it was single-stranded, by the way, the primers, the DNA polymerase, and regular nucleotides. And one test tube received dideoxyadenine nucleotide, one received dideoxythymine nucleotide, one received dideoxycytosine nucleotide, and one received dideoxyguanine nucleotide. So again, four test tubes, each one with the DNA to be sequenced, which was single-stranded, the primers, the DNA polymerase, and all four of the regular nucleotides. But the dideoxynucleotides are each placed separately into the four tubes. Now, if you're thinking ahead, this tube will have DNA fragments synthesized until an A base is encountered. The dideoxynucleotide will be added but cause chain termination. All the fragments in this tube will end with an A base. All the fragments in this tube will end with a C base. All the fragments in this tube with a T base. And all the fragments in this tube will end with a G base. So in each tube, DNA copies are made until a dideoxy base is inserted, thus chain termination, thus fragments are formed. So for example, if the template is this strand, this is the strand to be sequenced, then some fragments in the G tube, all starting with a primer, would end here, some fragments starting with a primer would end here, and some fragments would end here. But note, all the fragments in the G tube end with a G base. Then once DNA replication and the fragments had occurred in each test tube, he separated the fragments using gel electrophoresis, each tube getting a lane in a gel. The fragments separate according to their size, short fragments migrating in the electric field further down the gel, and large fragments migrating only short distances. Now, each fragment in this lane ends with a T. Each fragment in this lane ends with a C. Each fragment in this lane ends with a G. And each fragment in this lane ends with an A. Can you see how he sequenced the entire gene? Each band in the gel corresponds to a fragment that ends in a particular base. In the G lane, this band corresponds to a small G fragment. And this band corresponds to a large G fragment. All the fragments in this lane are G fragments. All the fragments in this lane are T fragments. All the fragments in this lane are C fragments and all the fragments in this lane are A fragments. So then Sanger just read the sequence using the gel as his guide. T, C, G, A, A, G, A, C, G, T, A, T, C. Again, four tubes, each with the appropriate materials for DNA replication, but each tube has a chain terminating dideoxy nucleotide, all the fragments in this tube end with adenine. All the fragments in this tube end with cytosine. All the fragments in this tube end with guanine. And in this tube, thymine. The contents of each tube are run on a gel, gel electrophoresis, with each tube representing a separate lane. The fragments separate according to size. Then the gel is sequenced. The DNA code of interest is sequenced. A, C, C, C. G, T, T, A, G, C, C, G, A, T, C, A, A, G, G, etc. That's the Sanger method, and it's elegant.
I've come back to this slide to remind you of where I left off. PCR provides sufficient DNA for DNA analysis in fingerprinting, used for forensics, paternity cases, immigration cases, and determination of genetic disease. Let's dig into DNA profiling in paternity cases and forensics investigations. And here are the relevant IB syllabus statements. Describe the application of DNA profiling to determine paternity and also in forensics investigations. Analyze DNA profiles to draw conclusions about paternity or forensics investigations. State that tandem repeats, these are repetitive sequences, are used in DNA profiling. So let's look at an example just to give you an idea of how gel electrophoresis provides information in a crime case. In this image of a gel with various lanes of DNA that had been cut into fragments, we can see the lane comprising the DNA from the victim. A lane with the bands of DNA from suspect 1 and a lane with the bands from suspect 2. Some crime scene evidence, the sperm has been collected from the victim as well as other cells marked female. An analysis of the bands suggests that suspect 1 was at the crime scene. Suspect 1's sperm was found at the crime scene. Now it's important to note a few things. The boyfriend's DNA was also run in a lane and none of his DNA was found at the crime scene. The latter's are DNA fragments of known size. And for time's sake, let's not discuss the need for control lanes. Now lastly, before moving forward, I want to note a few details that's important for you to keep in mind. The DNA collected at crime scenes is often collected in minute quantities. PCR has been used to amplify the quantity for this kind of analysis. Now the DNA used in gel electrophoresis is not from a specific gene. In fact, the single copy genes that produce protein are nearly identical in all people, thus cannot be used in such a situation. Thus, the DNA used in forensics or paternity cases or immigration cases tends to be repetitive sequences of DNA that does not code for protein. These repetitive sequences are known as tandem repeats. Here's a diagram that shows the repetitive sequences that are used in forensics or paternity cases. The repetitive sequences from the victim, from the suspect, and from DNA collected at the crime scene are used in DNA analysis. Restriction enzymes cut these pieces of DNA into fragments, and then based on the bands in a gel, we can analyze the DNA. And here we can see the matchup between the crime scene DNA and the suspect DNA. Repetitive regions vary widely in humans. No two people, maybe except identical twins, will have ex exactly the same set of repetitive regions, and hence no two people would have the same DNA fingerprint. These repetitive sequences are used in DNA profiling, and they're called tandem repeats. Here is an image of the nitrocellulose paper used in southern blotting, where the paper has blotted a gel. The information here will be used in a forensics investigation, a murder case. You can see that the DNA collected from the defendant's clothes match the victim's blood. And don't forget that these are the syllabus statements that we are following. I'll let you review this slide on your own. Study this slide on your own to determine the results of two paternity cases. Turn the movie off now or follow along with me. In the gel on the left, you can see that the bands of the child do not match the bands with the alleged father. The child has a band here that matches with his mother, but not with the father. The child alleged father mix is a lane that's run as a control to ensure a valid analysis of the bands. On the right, you can see that the child matches bands with the alleged father and with the mother. By the way, a mother's relationship to her child is rarely in question because she gave birth to the child. The question of who the father was always lingers. Here's an example of how DNA analysis of repetitive sequences were used to free a man wrongly convicted. Earl Washington spent 20 years in jail until DNA analysis from the crime scene was used to re-examine the case. The repetitive sequence of DNA from the crime scene did not match 
the DNA of Earl Washington. This is a gel from the O.J. Simpson case from 1994 in the United States. O.J. Simpson was a well-known American football player and Hollywood actor. Simpson was accused of murdering his wife and Ronald Goldman with a knife. Simpson's blood was found in the foyer of Brown's home on Bundy Drive. Interestingly, Simpson was acquitted. Here is a photograph of a gel having been treated with ethidium bromide that illuminates the DNA fragments using UV light. Remember, gel electrophoresis is used to separate proteins or fragments of DNA according to size. Now with the last three slides, I would like to extend your thinking on how repetitive sequences, tandem repeats, can provide very specific genetic information from the analysis of gels run through electrophoresis. Genes have repetitive sequences near them. These would be repetitive sequence on the disease-causing allele, and these would be repetitive sequences on the normal allele. And you can see the restriction enzyme cut sites. The repetitive sequences just upstream of the disease allele are different than the repetitive sequences just upstream of the normal allele. And since the repetitive sequences differ, the cut sites differ, and the fragments produced would be different, Thus, the analysis of a gel would show these fragment differences as different bands. Now, just as a note, the varying repetitive sequences that result in these different restriction sites are called restriction fragment length polymorphisms, or reflips for short. The presence of a band that accompanies an allele is called a marker. Let me show you an example. Here is human DNA sample 1, known as allele 1, and here is allele 2. Due to different repetitive sequences, the DNA in this first sample is cut at two sites, creating three bands on the gel, X, W, and Y. The DNA in the second sample is only cut at one site, resulting in two bands on the gel. The extra band associated with allele 1 is a marker that would identify anyone with such a band as having allele 1 rather than allele 2. Huntington's disease results from a dominant allele. If a parent has the Huntington's allele, the parent passes the allele to children with a 50% probability. Now, a family pedigree was created among individuals in two families in Venezuela by Nancy Wexler. The DNA of the children was cut with a restriction enzyme, HIN-D3, and the fragments were run using gel electrophoresis, and the results are seen here. The family on the right has no Huntington's. The father for the family on the left has Huntington's. Can you see the marker that identifies the children on the left that have Huntington's? The children whose DNA lanes are marked with a plus have a fragment that is inherited with the Huntington's allele. And that brings us to the end of IB Bio, Genetic Modification and Biotechnology, Part 3.